Welcome aboard, Giants fans, to episode 35 of Talk is Cheap, our New York Giants podcast right here on NJ.com. I'm Joe Giglio. With me, as always, Jordan Renan. Jordan, how are you, bud? What's up, Joe? Fresh off a win. First time in uh, about a month. Yeah, it's been a while. And, of course, more, James More than Fred, a month, actually. More than a month. It was a long time had, for had the, the Giants. Bi- had the bye week in there. Yeah, think about yeah. it. A lot, a lot of time in between wins. It was. James, how you doing? Hey, Joe, what's up? How are you? Doing well. Uh, doing well. I and mean, the Giants are doing well. Like Jordan just said, they're a 31-24 victory on Monday Night Football against the Dolphins in what was a very entertaining game back and forth. Uh, and obviously the story now is the Giants get the win. They're at 6-7. and seven, And Odell Beckham Jr. and Eli Manning light it up. So let's, let's start there and then we'll work our way you know, to this game coming up against the undefeated Panthers. Monday Night Football, you guys are down in Miami. And from my perspective, guys, and we'll start with you, Jordan. From my perspective, that game was even except for three different things. One, the Dolphins had a ridiculous amount of bad penalties. Just crazy, you know, unsportsman likes and face masks. And then the two best players in the field, Eli and Beckham, were on the Giants' side. To me, that was, that was the entire difference in the game. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I mean, the first thing I wrote after the game was the fact that the Giants got what they needed and is their two superstars won in that game. Uh, you know, that was the difference. It was Odell Beckham. And Eli Manning on one side against Ryan Tannehill and Jarvis Landry on the other side. And really, there's no comparison between those two combinations. The Giants have the way better at both ends of that. Now, like you said, the Dolphins, um, their penalties. But to me, it was even more than that. The Dolphins, first of all, they almost, I don't know if they would have won or not, but they gifted the Giants an opportunity to win that game. Lamar Miller, one carry in the second half. Are you kidding me? Uh, they, they didn't play Odell Beckham tight at the line of scrimmage, letting him all the Giants receivers get free runs off the line of scrimmage, playing soft coverage all game. I mean, what are the Dolphins doing? And then the penalties, like you said, it's just – you look at that team and you're like, holy cow, what is going on over there? No wonder why they, they, they stink. No wonder why they're, they're now, what, 5-8? and eight? I mean, that's just a bad team. But good win for the Giants. They needed it. They're now still tied for first place in the NFC East. Believe it or not, they went over a month without a victory here. Three straight losses. Uh, They had the bye week there, too. And yet, you still look at it. All that's happened with this team, all the blown wins, they're still tied for first place. And there's three weeks left in the season. They are. James, how about for you, for Monday Night Football down in Miami, you know, the, the Beckham plays usually come as big plays, and all of a sudden mm-hmm. you look up and, wow, he has a gigantic game. But when did you realize what kind of game Eli Manning was having? I mean, I, for me it was around halftime when I just looked up at his stats and I said, wow, he doesn't really have very many incompletions at all. I mean, he's been on target the entire night. When was it for you when you started saying, he's really in a groove here? It, it was at halftime. You know, obviously uh, halftime ended, so I went left the press box area, went to the back, got something to drink, got something to eat, and uh, – the Dolphins have like TV screens with like stat lines up on the wall. So as I'm walking back to my seat, I look up and it, I flashes Eli's at like 14 of 16, 12 of 14, something like that. And I was like, Whoa, Eli's really playing well tonight. And, uh, and obviously that continued basically the same second half. He only had four incompletions. Um, he, he was just brilliant. He was exactly, you know, he just got named NFC offensive player of the week on Wednesday morning, right after before we taped this, um, he, he was just superb, and, and he was what the Giants needed him to be in that spot. They had really only put up seven offensive points because the first three points of the game came courtesy of a turnover. They really didn't do anything with it. So it really was that drive late in the first half when they went down the field and he hit Will Ty with a beautiful pass for a touchdown. That's sort of when you know their offense really started to hit stride a little bit, in my opinion. That, that's really what it felt like. Because up until that point, I mean – they had fumbled the series before. They had messed up the exchange with Andre Williams. They had a turnover that they really didn't do anything with offensively, uh, the first drive of the game. So the offense really hadn't done that much until that last drive of the first half, and then everything turned. It did, and, and Odell Beckham started to make you know the big plays that we're now used to him making. But this has been a big week. Yeah, the 45-yarder re- came on that, on that drive. Exactly. And I think the reaction here to Beckham was a primetime game. He had a gigantic game, made some really big plays. And, and then I think the, you kind of use that and go against the numbers everyone's seeing on ESPN, where he's now basically number one in almost every category when it comes to a receiver at his age, second year in the league. And we talk about him all year. I mean, we're, we're around Beckham. We know what he's done. But I mean, for, for both of you guys, 
I mean, you get to watch him up close all the time. He's a tremendous young player here. Uh, but Monday night, it almost felt like he was taking it to another level. I don't know if it was playing against Landry, but, I mean, that play he had where it was the, uh, the big touchdown play where it was kind of the slant and go. You watch the replays of it. I mean, the speed he has there, Jordan, to just get away. I mean, no one could catch him when he gets going there. Yeah, I mean, you see it. When, you, when we're at games, I mean, I, this is like the third or fourth time I, I've, I've said it. I mean, you see him catch that pass, and then you just you say, oh, it's over, touchdown, it's gone. Like, there's no way that anybody, like, once he gets half a step, it's over. Nobody's nobody's tracking him down. You know, he mentioned this last year, and it's very interesting. He mentioned it after the season that he still was he was playing last year, and he still wasn't a hundred percent. There was a couple instances where he actually did get caught from behind. It was a one against the Indianapolis Colts on Monday Night Football. He had a huge play, but he kind of stumbled at the end. And you know, he said his his hamstring still wasn't there, and I think that's the difference. You see it this year. The second he's in the clear this year, there's just no way anyone's catching up to him. Last year, regardless of all the success he had, you did see that a little bit. So it's curious. But to be honest with you, Joe, I don't even view this as him taking it to another level. This is just what he does every week. He's that good. You just need to get him the ball as much as possible. Even the two incompletions, I mean, he had seven catches for, what, 166 yards it was, I believe. Yeah, 166 and two. There was nine targets officially. The two targets, that, by the way, that officially weren't for incompletions were two passes that didn't even get near him. One was pretty much tipped at the line of scrimmage, and the other one he like kind of almost threw away or it hit a lineman or something. It was a really weird play. So even those two incompletions, they weren't even really incompletions to Odell Beckham. There weren't any chance in the world that he was that there were going to be completions and that those were catches from. So all seven balls that were to him went for completions. Plus, let's add the fact that he caused a, pa- a pass interference deep downfield and forced another penalty. So, really, that's nine, nine plays where he could have made because something positive could happen, and they got nine, nine, nine positive plays out of that. That's how good it was. Yeah, they did. It's amazing how productive he is and, and how they don't need – I mean, they've had games this year where they've uh, targeted him 15, 16, 17 times. But this was a game, like you just said, Jordan, nine targets – Yet he has all this production. I think one of Eli's four yeah, completions. It was really was, eleven now, because like I said, there was two penalties. So I mean, right. eleven's not a bad number for him. It isn't, and I think one of. I mean, I don't know if it was incompletion because there was a penalty. He had an offensive pass interference, I believe, at one point. It was one of the rare throws I thought Eli had where he wasn't spot on. But on that one, if not for the penalty, and maybe if Eli leads him a little bit more, it was up the right sideline. I mean, he's probably gone on that one too. We're, we're talking about a two hundred and forty yard game if he catches that. If that one connects. Yeah, Eli was hit. That's the only reason why that would that you know he didn't really get to step into it and get it out there enough. He didn't, James. When you're watching this guy all year long, and um, you know everyone's just in amazement here. It, to me, the, the crazy part is like Jordan was just saying. It, it's almost it doesn't even feel like it's that big of a deal. This is just what he does, and defenses know he's the focal point, and yet they can't stop. They can't do anything. I think I've said it before, he's a generational type talent. And I think that you kind of have to look at him, you know, with that mindset that he is, look, I I would say it's only, he's not even done with his second season in the league, but he's on pace to be one of the the all-time greats. And this is what great players do on a weekly basis. Um, He's just, he's something else to watch. And, you know, where would the Giants be without this guy? Dead. I mean, they, I mean they, they're 6-7 and seven with him, and they haven't had a winning record with him. But like you just said, with, without him, um, you can't imagine where he'd be. And who knows where Eli Manning's you know, career would be at this point because he's had two tremendous years in a row now um, with Beckham by his side. All right, we want to play a little game here. Wait, Joe, can, ep- I say, can I say one thing? We talk, about, we talk about the talent of this team all the time and say oh, they really, they're really just don't have enough talent. They're not good enough in a lot of spots. And grant, when we look at the totality of it all, I think we almost underestimate, like, when you're comparing the Giants' talent to t- talent of other teams, sure, they're, they're weak at a lot of spots. But what you also have to factor in is, A, they have the quarterback. You know, they have a quarterback that you know you can win with, which is a huge thing in the NFL. And, B, they have one of the best players in the league at wide receiver. So that alone does not leave this team as you look at it and say, oh, they have no talent. Basically, every other team in the league that doesn't have a quarterback is below them on the talent level because they're, they don't have a guy at that spot. So put those two guys in the equation. I don't think the Giants are as talentless as some people make them out to be. 
It's a good point because when you have advantages at those two positions, with the way the league is set up right now, you have an advantage, right? So you could, you know, you could kind of be a little bit more deficient in other areas and still be okay. So you mentioned talent there, Jordan, and obviously Beckham is a, as James called him, a generational type of player. He's an, an amazing talent, and a lot of the conversation on Monday night during the game was, you know, is this guy the best non-quarterback in the game? How, I mean, just how great of a player we're we watching right now. So we have a little game here. There's seven players we have, non-quarterbacks, great players right now, or, or young ones that are on their way to being great. And I want to know for each of you, would you take this player or Odell Beckham if you were starting a franchise tomorrow, okay? Okay. Let's all right, here do we it. go. All right, we'll go, we'll go to James and then Jordan on all these. So James first, then Jordan. All right, we'll start with, uh, we'll start with this one, James. Rob Gronkowski or Odell Beckham Jr.? Ooh, that's tough. Um, Odell. Yeah, I'm going Odell, too. I think it's just a position where you could have a little more impact when you're on the outside. It's a little yeah. harder for tight ends to dominate. And granted, Gronk does dominate. Plus, he has that injury history that injury does history, yeah. scare you. Yeah. So I think this is a close one, though. I do agree with James on that one. I'm, I'm, but I, I go with Odell also here. Yeah, to me, it's, it, I would go Odell as well. The only thing, and I guess that why it's a fun debate on this one, is there's fewer tight ends that are great. You could find, uh, yeah, and we've seen a lot of good, good young receivers coming to the NFL, but I would take um, Beckham as well. All right, player number two, and this was the first one I thought of when we, um, we thought about doing this segment here. James, J.J. Watt or Odell Beckham Jr. starting a team tomorrow? I would say... Oh, wow, that's that's tough. Um, I, I'll say Odell just for this. I, look, JJ Watt is a sensational player, but can you get something close to Watt's production with one or two guys? I, I think so. Plus, you know, when you got a guy on defense, you can kind of run away from him. You can game plan around him, try to contain him. Odell's the type of guy where if you try to contain him, him other guys are going to beat you. Yeah, I'd go J.J. Watt in the snap decision for me. To me, he's actually the best player in the league that's a non-quarterback by far. Uh, you know, when you, he gets 20-ish sacks from a defensive end spot in a 3-4, I mean, just let that soak in for a little bit of how good this guy is. He completely disrupts opposing offenses. Just He's just too good. I mean, J.J. I, Watt, to me, this, this one actually is easy, and I am a huge Odell fan. Uh, in regards to talent and and production and difference difference he makes on the field, but JJ Watt to me is uh, a slightly different level. Yeah, it's amazing how quickly Beckham's star has risen here. That 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 you know you guys are, you went on different sides of it, and and you have to you kind of have to acknowledge how great Watt is before you you say you're taking him. But it's not a bad choice for either of you. I mean, Watt is Watt's that good, and and Beckham certainly is too. All right, player number three. Richard Sherman or Odell Beckham Jr., James? Oh, Odell, without a doubt. This was Sherman, you know, it, it, he's kind of he's kind of ebbed and flowed. He might be on the downside. You know, cornerbacks, I think we're kind of seeing this with Darrell Revis. When, when they slip a little bit, they slip a lot. So I, I definitely would go Odell. Yeah, I'm going Odell. I like Richard Sherman. He's a good, borderline great player. But he's not an... You know, he's not a, as James likes to say, generational talent type player to me. Uh, very, very good player. Great player at times, but also a little bit older. Um, not a, He's not a guy that's an absolute shutdown like, you know, like Darrell Rebus was in his prime, in my estimation, either. So to me, this is a rather easy one. I'm going Beckham. Actually, remember Beckham went up against him last year and really kind of made him look foolish as a rookie. He did in Seattle, and and like you said earlier, Jordan, he wasn't even a hundred percent last year when he did that. Yeah. So if they play Richard today, Sherman, Richard Sherman left there, and he kind of that was kind of like the the point where everyone was like, "Holy cow!" Because Richard Sherman was like, "This guy is for real." I mean, you know, you know, I I went up to him. I think he went up to him after the game and said, "You know, keep doing it, man. You're for real." And that was sort of like, okay, maybe this is how good this guy, this kid and young man, is going to be. And it turned out that he, that is true. And this kid is for real. If Sherman. If Sherman thinks that. All right, James, we'll go to this one. Another great young wide receiver, a little bit older than Beckham. Uh, not much, though. And he's put up ridiculous numbers as well, and he's very versatile. Antonio Brown of the Steelers or Odell Beckham Jr.? 
I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with Odell just for now. I mean, look, Brown's you know a bigger guy, um, but I, I think Odell just the speed that he has, the breakaway potential, and I think that Odell's a guy who, if the Giants wanted to, they could use him in, in a little bit more creative, different ways, and he could be even more explosive. So I'll go with Odell. Man, this is a tough one. Uh, I really love Antonio Brown. I'm gonna. Oof. This is tough. I'm starting a franchise, and I have to pick one of these two guys, huh? I am going to go, in this case, with Odell Beckham, uh, only because he's probably a little bit – he's a little bit younger. I'm not sure exactly Brown's age, but he's he's a little bit older. Beckham's – they're they're pretty similar players in my mind, but Beckham has the age working in his favor, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with that one. That's the only thing that differentiates him to me. Antonio Brown does everything amazingly well uh he runs great routes he can get downfield he can make great plays he's shifty i love antonio brown but i'm going i'll I'll take beckham but have no problem if you tell me i have to take antonio brown yeah i think most quarterbacks would take either of these guys i mean they're both tremendous i would take beckham too but it's it's not there's not a big gap uh like you were kind of alluding to there between antonio brown and odell beckham all right now we're going to go to uh, a pair of really young players. What, the first one we'll talk about is a second-year guy and then uh, a rookie. We'll go to the second-year guy first. Same draft class as Odell Beckham Jr. Taken, I believe, seven picks before him. Not sure how much of, of the NFL games you guys got to watch on Sunday before uh, you know being at the game Monday night. But if you watched any of the Raiders-Broncos game, you had to see Khalil Mack uh, put up five sacks. Has 14 now on the year. Um, he, he Maybe he should have been the first pick over Clowney uh, in 2014 for a pass rusher. James, Khalil Mack or Odell Beckham Jr.? Uh, I, I think it's it's tough. Like, I was, the Watt situation is a little older. I would say, you know, if he's going to play the way he did on Sunday, that Khalil Mack is a guy because he could be your cornerstone pass rusher, which, as we've learned this season, if you don't have a pass rush, you've got a lot of problems in this league. Um, so I will say by a hair, I will take a guy like Khalil Mack if he's going to play like that every week. Yeah, but from everything I've heard is Khalil Mack's been great now for two years also. Uh, so I'm going to take him as well because positional importance in my, you know, if I'm building a team and starting a team, I, you know, the number one, you start with a quarterback, right? So. If the quarterback, if, if there's a great quarterback and a great wide receiver, I'm taking the great quarterback. And number two is pass rusher. If there's a great pass rusher and a great wide receiver, I'm taking the great pass rusher. So only because of positional importance, I'm going with Khalil Mack here. Yeah, I agree, I agree with the way you, Jordan, the way you said uh, building a team. I mean, you get the pass rushers, you get the quarterback, the opposite, or you get the quarterback, then the pass rushers, and then, then you try to find some weapons for the quarterback. To yeah, weapons, play. Is, weapons is right after. Then, right, then, so, cor- then cornerback. I think cornerback is, is a huge. Yeah, it all r- revolves around the passing game, stopping it and, and obviously making plays yourself. All exactly. Right. So now we go to a rookie, a guy that uh, I've heard people use the word generational talent the way you did, James, for Odell Beckham Jr. Now he plays a position that you know, it, it could go any minute, uh, but he's obviously very good right now. Todd Gurley or Odell Beckham Jr., James? <sighs> See, to me... This is a tough one because, look, running backs are, are kind of dime a dozen in the league, and you can be successful with different guys. But when you have a guy like Todd Gurley, if he stays healthy, and that's a humongous if, you have a guy that could potentially be – I feel like running backs with a risk-reward situation, there's a major reward if a guy like Todd Gurley stays healthy for the next decade. So I will take Todd Gurley – as he has played this season over Odell, just because, you know, you can have a great wide receiver, but to find a guy who's going to carry the ball and run for 130 yards and basically every week, you know, that, that's pretty special. Yeah, Mr. SEC over there, James. Uh, I know you, yeah. you love those SEC guys. <laughs> well, no, it's just... South, I mean, South Carolina you, background. I, I, I can't take Todd Gurley. We went, we went over the positional importance before. I mean, I, to me, unless, you know, he's got to be Adrian Peterson, which... I like Todd Gurley, and I think he's going to be a great player. I don't think he's ultimately the Adrian Peterson-level greatness. So I'm going with Odell Beckham here rather easily, if you ask me. I mean, like you said, running back is a spot where you just 
first of all, he, he isn't a guy who right now, at least he doesn't even help you in the passing game. He doesn't, he, you know, he's a two down back right now. So, uh, I think Gurley can ultimately be that three down back and be that dominant, great player, but he's not Adrian Peterson in my mind. And he's not Odell Beckham either. So Beckham, bigger impact on the game, bigger playmaker. And, uh, to me, is just a safer bet at a more important position. It's interesting. If we had this debate 10 or 15 years ago, I think it would have been, you guys might have said the opposite. You, you, take that, you know, take that number one star running back because that was right when the game started to change a little bit. But now uh, I'd probably take Beckham too, as great as Gurley could be. All right, last one for you guys. And, and this guy, this name, for you know, every fan listening, might not quite yet be on the same level as the other ones we've talked about, but... Uh, I think they're going to hear more about him this week, going to get a chance to watch him if you haven't watched him much so far. Uh, and just based on the way he's played this year, uh, he's played like one of the you know top players in the NFL. James, for you, right now, Odell Beckham Jr. or Panthers cornerback Josh Norman, who has basically shut down every wide receiver and really good ones that he's played this year. Can I make my pick after the game on Sunday? See, you can't, you got, you can't do that because we need to see how smart you are and who wins this battle Sunday. Uh, you know what? I will take Norman. Um, I don't know if Josh is going to shut down Odell the way he has every other guy in the league. But, you know, when you have a great cornerback and, and he can do what Josh Norman has done and he's proven it week in and week out, then, you know, you, you've got something that not a lot of people can contend with. So on their records and overall body of work, I will take Norman, but I, I would want to not make the pick until uh, about four thirty, five o'clock on Sunday. Yeah, I will say I'm pretty close to taking Norman too, but I'm going to lean towards Beckham just because, again, I look at it and I say the importance and the, the, the ability for these guys to make a difference for my team overall. I just think wide receiver is a, a little bit more potential there to make plays and make a difference, you know. When you have a guy who's a uh, shutdown corner, you can just, you know, pick on the other guy and go to the other side and go, you know, target running backs. I know it takes great receivers out of the game, but I just, I don't know, receiver to me is just, just can make a bigger impact. So I like the receiver in this case. Josh Norman's, though, making a, a great case to get into this category and have be the pick when you do these kind of things because he is he's entering Darrell Revis ter- type territory where you just put him on the top receiver and that, that receiver is now out of the game. So maybe next by next year I could say for sure that, I, that you know I, I my opinion might be different just because Josh Norman is that much of a difference maker. But right now I'm I'm going with Beckham. It's a great point you made there, that, that Revis comparison, uh, Jordan, because Kim Jones of the NFL Network, she's around the Giants a lot. She had a tweet on Wednesday morning comparing Josh Norman uh, and what he's done so far. Yards allowed this year to some top receivers. I mean, he's allowed 89 combined yards to te- DeAndre Hopkins from the Texans, Mike Evans from the Bucks, uh, T.Y. Hilton from the Colts, Des Bryant, obviously from the Cowboys, and Julio Jones from the Falcons. Five of the top, I mean, whatever, 15 or 20 receivers in the NFL – uh, and total 89 yards. That's not an average, not you know one or two of them. That's total. And now he gets to go up against Beckham. So, I mean, this – and we'll get into the game now for a few minutes coming up Sunday, Giants-Panthers. To me, that's – that matchup, it's got everything right there. I mean, it's the top corner in the league right now against the top wide receiver, James. I mean, it, that matchup, if they do move him out on Beckham every play, which you'd imagine they're probably going to do, that's yes. must-see TV. Yeah, no, I mean, it's it's basically going to be what we – Everyone hyped and thought and hoped they would get with Revis Beckham, but it actually good might point. be better. Yeah, it's a good point. I mean, be this. I think at this point, Josh Norman has proven to be the better cornerback this year. Uh, so, yeah, this is the, the marquee matchup. Maybe the, the, the wide receiver that's playing the best in the NFL right now, six straight 100-yard receiving games, which is insane, against the cornerback who shuts everybody down. So, yeah. Great matchup. Now, you mentioned the name in there, Joe. That was the one I'm surprised you didn't do, Julio Jones. If you gave me the option of Julio Jones and Beckham, that's the one I would really, you know, think twice about because I like Julio. I love, I'm a big Julio guy. I love that size. Yeah, he's a great player. And I mean, he's been so, he's been good enough to justify all they gave up for him a few years ago. The Falcons have a lot of problems, but 
Uh, they hit on that one. Julio Jones, uh, he really is a tremendous player. All right, so Giants, Panthers, Sunday. The storylines coming into this one, I mean, we know. If the Giants are 6-7, and seven, you have the 13-0 and 0 Carolina Panthers. There's going to be a lot of, um, you know, kind of look backs because it was 15, you know, 17 years ago. Uh, 1998, the Giants were under 500, 13-0. and 0. Uh, Elway and the Broncos come in and they upset them. I'm sure that's going to be a big storyline. But for this week, for this game, James, I know you had a piece on NJ.com kind of looking at the Panthers and, and for Giants fans, you know, things they might not know about them. It, to me, they've almost been disrespected a little bit. I feel like I, I see a lot of, you know, the worst 12-0 and team ever, the worst 13-0 and team ever, yet they win every week. Yeah, I mean, it's like, uh, like w- there's like uh, the main NFL stats site. There's like 18 statistical categories for when you run up a team defensive report. And the Panthers are in the single digits ranking in the league in 14 of them. You know, their offense is they have the highest scoring offense in the league. They basically have, you know, one could argue the best defense in the league. Um, they're just a really, really good team that's going to beat you up on both sides of the ball. And for some reason, I don't know if it's because Cam Newton's stats aren't, you know, knock your socks off. I, I don't know if it's because they play in a small or medium market. I mean, Charlotte's not s- that small, but it's you know, not a big market. Um, just they don't seem to get the, the national respect that – I think if you change the name on their jerseys and you put them in Chicago or or New York or wherever, people would be calling them, you know, the next eighty five Bears. Even if even if that was the Packers, yeah, I agree. They yeah. would be, they would they would be everybody would be raving about the Carolina Pan Carolina Panthers, you know, the Carolina Packers or whatever. So but, you know, as James said, this is a very good, well rounded team, great defense. Very good offense, very good running game, quarterback playing at a very, very high level. And the difference is the Giants are about as one-dimensional a team as you've ever seen. You know, they're, they're so reliant on Eli Manning and Odell Beckham, and those two do, being the only two that are ba- basically making all the big plays. I mean, for you know, we talked about the running game for the Giants. We're, we're praising the Giants' running game for running for 93 yards the other day. I mean, that's the, that's the point we've reach with the running game you know against a team that averages allowed over 130 yards running a game so the fact that we're talking about that just shows you about how one-dimensional this giant team is and if josh norman could take away that one dimension it's hard to envision the giants having a chance against the carolina panther team that's really good and that's really good in a lot of different places and has a lot of different places where they can make plays and so just Giant team that is really just narrowed down. It's such a, a singular focus of, okay, hey, it's Odell Beckham and Eli Manning. Those are the guys that are going to do the damage against you. So, Jordan, I think that leads us into the, the question I wanted to ask both of you for this game, for this game against the Panthers coming up. We know about Beckham and Eli, and they're going to have to play well to give the Giants a chance. That's every week. But who else has to step up? We talked about the running. You just talked about the running game being a little bit better on Monday night. Give me a couple players that have to step up and give the Giants something on Sunday against Carolina if they're going to pull off the upset of the season. We'll go to you first, Jordan. Yeah, I just don't see how they do it. They're not going to be able to run the ball. I just, I just can't envision that happening. So I'm going to say they need something from Shane Vereen out of the backfield catching the ball, especially if Josh Norman is shadowing Odell Beckham around. And they also need something. They need a big game from Jason Pierre-Paul. Protecting those edges against Cam Newton is huge. So those defensive ends, they need to pressure Cam constantly, force him into bad throws, and uh, protect that edge and make sure that he doesn't get outside. That has been actually a weak point of this team in recent years is letting quarterbacks on the outside, and Pierre, Pierre Paul is part of that. So uh, I think that those two guys are two guys that they absolutely need to have big games to have any chance. James, how about for you, guys that have to step up here for the Giants on Sunday against Carolina, outside of Eli and Odell, who just you know have to be a given every week now? I definitely think the defensive secondary has to step up. I mean, you know, Landon Collins in particular, I mean, you know, Greg Olson, the tight end, Jersey boy, is the Panthers' go-to you know, receiving target. So they got – and tight ends have killed the Giants all year long. Um, you know, Ted Ginn is a, is a fast guy who, if he gets behind you, you're cooked. So – DRC and Prince of Mukamara are going to have to play well. Um, I also think, you know, whoever's at uh, the offensive line. I mean, I know Jordan said they're not going to be able to run the ball well, but even then, you know, the Panthers are going to get after the quarterback as well. 
know, that line, whoever's on that line, because, you know, they're eternally banged up now. You know, Flowers, again, had the ankle give out on him in the second half on Monday night. Um, they're going to have to hold up as well. So it, it's they're going to need basically everybody, I think, to play well in order to have a chance. Yeah, they probably – I mean, they do, obviously. When you're playing a 13-0 and team this late in the season, an undefeated team, you have to be on your A game to have a chance to win here against them. And now off of the win in Miami, 6-7. and seven. So as we look forward to this game and look forward to – I mean, everyone kept pace in the NFC last week. You have the 6-7 and seven Redskins. You have the 6-7 and seven Eagles, the 6-7 and seven Giants. Um, have, have your thoughts changed for either of you on, you know, what the Giants – they're standing here in the NFC based on last week or – is this really just a week-to-week thing for you, Jordan, right now as we kind of look forward, Panthers, Vikings, and then Eagles, and, and how this division shapes up? Yeah, I mean, like we always said, three out of four was the likely scenario. Still think that's the case. Win three out of four, get that win. If long as one of those wins is in you know week 17 against the Eagles, I think that should be enough to get it done. You'll get some help somewhere along the way. I just don't see the Eagles or the Redskins, uh, you know, either of them winning out. I just said – I just – I don't know. First of all, one they have to play each other, so one of them's getting a loss there. So that's at least one of those teams getting a loss. The Redskins, they you know held on by the skin of their Robbie Gould miss kicks uh, the <laughs> other day. So you know they're not they're not in it by any means dominant. They could lose to anyone. They could lose to the Cowboys again in Dallas. That's a possibility. They, they could lose uh, to the Bills this week, even though they're at home, and they could lose to the Eagles, obviously. So. You know, win three out of four in these last four games. They already got one under their belt, so now they got to do two out of three. The key is they have Carolina this week, at Minnesota next week, two good teams, two games where they're going to be pretty hefty underdogs. They're, they're about five-point underdogs at home, which is a huge, pretty big number uh, for the for a team that's tr- vying for the division title to be five-point underdogs at home. And they're going to be pretty big underdogs the next week against the Vikings, even if they win against the Carolina Panthers, I bet that I would I would bet that they're underdogs against the Vikings. So, you know, the Giants have to get one of these two games, and that's not going to be an easy thing to do. James, how about for you? NFC East, did last week change anything? The Eagles back up their win against the Patriots with a win over the Bills, mm-hmm. and the Redskins, like Jordan was just saying there, they get their first road win against the Bears. Didn't really change anything for me. I still think that the Giants, I think we said last week, they won. They had to beat the Dolphins. They beat the Dolphins. Now these next two weeks, they've got to win one of these games. Um, they got to be careful though, because I, I I read online. I guess there's a scenario in theory where the Giants could get eliminated. I guess in terms of tiebreakers, if everything breaks wrong this weekend and they lose to the Panthers. Um, I don't think the Eagles are. I think don't think the Eagles are going to beat the Cardinals on Sunday. So that the Giants should be okay in that sense. But you know, look, the Giants. They, they need to win one of these next two games, and they're going to need help somewhere. It might not be a lot of help, but they're going to need help. They're going to need the Eagles and the Redskins to not to stumble somewhere, um, and they have a shot in Week 17. But as Jordan said, you got the Panthers here, you got the Vikings. Sunday night, it's going to be like negative 60, not something like that. So, uh, you know, it, it's a tough road to hoe, but – they at least are still in it with three weeks to go, which they were not guaranteed when they took the field on Monday night. James, you might not have heard of this global warming thing that's going on around. This is here. true. This is true. It's like sixty degrees in the you know East Rutherford yeah. every day. Uh, you guys are going to go from what, what was the temperature in Miami on Monday night? It was pretty hot yeah, down there. It was pretty warm. Yeah, yeah it was probably, you guys are going to go from it Miami. Was during the day. So you have eighty-ish in Miami. You guys are back, obviously here at home in New Jersey, whatever it is, sixty-five in December, and then. Um, I'm sure it's going to be a little colder next Sunday night in Minnesota. So you guys are all over the place with that. Yes. Yeah, don't, don't worry. Fortunately for us, you know, we are not tough guys. We sit in a heated press box. So, you know, it's not like we're really toughing it or anything. So you guys don't need IVs at halftime the way o- Odell Beckham Jr. did on Monday? No. We were drinking Mountain Dews. Yeah. That, that's, I think that sums it up pretty well. We're drinking Mountain Dews. Uh, He's having IVs. All right, so this has been episode (laughs) 35. Guys, as always, thanks for doing it. We'll catch up on uh, next week, early next week, um, after the Giants and Panthers. And uh, I'm sure we'll have a whole lot to talk about one way or the other. In the NFC East, uh, it's probably going to have a whole bunch of changes between now and then. Thanks for doing this, Jordan. Anytime, Joe. See you next time. We'll be back next week. Thanks, James. No problem, Joe. And thanks to all of you for listening. 
to episode 35 of Talk is Cheap, our New York Giants podcast right here on NJ.com. Follow the show at Jordan Renan, at James Scratch, at Joe Gileo Sports, and of course on iTunes and Stitcher. Download, subscribe, leave a rating. It helps the show grow. We'll be back with you next week after the Giants and the Panthers. <laughs>